Peter, thanks for sitting down with me in what is, I'm sure, a very busy schedule. Um, you're Vice Secretary General of UPOF. Can you share some of the latest news with UPOF? Okay, uh, well, it's good to be here, Marcel. Thanks for the opportunity sure. to speak to you. And uh, well, first of all, I think there are two areas where there's some interesting developments in UPOF. I think, first of all, we're seeing some really interesting information on the scale of the impact of the UPOF system. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. Uh, and also, we're seeing some interesting developments with regard to our online PBR applications for you of Prisma. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you mentioned uh, the impact of mm -hmm. UPOF. Can you uh, share maybe some of the most interesting findings there? Okay, well, what was really great was a, a new study that was conducted in Vietnam by an economist, an independent mm -hmm. study, Stefano Lepper. And what was really interesting there is he looked at the situation in Vietnam before they became a UPOF member mm -hmm. uh, and the situation after. And what was really interesting is in the 10 years before Vietnam became a UPOF member, there mm -hmm. were increases in yield in major crops such as rice and maize and sweet potato. But virtually none of that was due to advances in plant breeding to, mm -hmm. to new plant varieties. Um, it was all due to increased inputs fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. Whereas, in the 10 years after Vietnam mm. became a UPOV member, then we saw real increases in uh, productivity due to plant breeding, and really quite substantial. In the case of, after 10 years, after uh, 10 years of UPOV membership, rice yields were 16% higher, maize 19%, sweet potato 27% higher. But what was really interesting is he went on to look at the economic impact. Of that. And that was really surprising to us because we had no idea of the scale of the impact. And what he found, he projected that this was worth around $5 billion annually to the economy, the GDP of Vietnam, which is more than 2.5% of their GDP. Mm -hmm. Those are some amazing numbers. Absolutely. I, uh, I think nobody ever uh, imagined the numbers to be uh, this, uh, this uh, stunning. No, exactly. And I think that was the interesting thing is we had no idea of the scale mm -hmm. of the impact. We knew some other cases such as uh, uh, in Kenya with the mm -hmm. rose industry gain a large scale impact. And we've just recently um, put on our website a video about the impact mm -hmm. on the cut flower industry uh, of UPOV membership. And there we know that access to new improved varieties had a huge impact in Kenya. And it's now and this industry worth well over half a billion dollars in, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another example. And, and we're really beginning to see now the scale of the impact of uh, UPOP membership and family this rights. That's amazing. You mentioned uh, the, the, the figures for, for yield increase and uh, the impact on the economy. But what happened with the farmers in, in Vietnam? Okay, yeah, that was another interesting aspect because they looked at the benefits for farmers. What they saw is after 10 years of UPOP membership, farm incomes were up by 24% in, in 10 years. So it was really significant. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the other thing that we're also getting some information about is the, the real benefits for farmers around the world of the plant breeders' rights system. We have a great story on a, a video coming up in the next few days mm -hmm. from Japan, okay. uh, where it shows how farmers can really capture value thanks to plant breeders' rights. And it, it's an interesting story about a rice variety called Suyahime, mm -hmm. which was developed by a local prefecture in, in Yamagata. And the great thing is there, this variety sells around 30 to 50% higher, uh, higher price in the mm -hmm. supermarkets compared to the current high value standard, which mm -hmm. is uh, Koshi Hickory. And it does that because it's a protected variety and the owners of the variety can control who grows ah. the variety and also how they grow it. And part of the, the brand value that's captured is because they grow it in a, an environmentally friendly way with low inputs. Okay. So the consumers know not only is this a great tasting uh, variety, it's great for, uh, for all sorts of uses, but also they like the fact that the way it's produced. And that means farmers get a much better income mm -hmm. from growing suyahime than they uh, do for other varieties of rice. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that's a really great example. And, uh, and also other parts of the world, we're seeing similar ways in which uh, farmers and growers benefit. Uh, we also have a new video from Canada mm. on the benefits for cherry growers in Canada. Okay. Uh, and they, uh, there it's explained the story that uh, 
before uh, the uh, local institutes protected their varieties of cherries. The, the Canadian cherry growers were the best in the world, I think, it, it, and they were being grown everywhere in the world and competing with Canadian growers. So Canadian taxpayers were paying to develop these wonderful new cherry varieties, mm -hmm. uh, but Canadian growers were struggling because they were being outcompeted. So now they started to protect their varieties of cherries in Canada, and that way they can give preferential access to Canadian growers, develop varieties uh, best suited to Canadian growers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Very good numbers. Excellent. Um, what, what, uh, what would you say is, uh, is the interplay between conservation and uh, plant-based rights? Oh, that's a good point, and I see it's a theme of the uh, ESA mm -hmm. meeting this week, so it's good to come to that. And in UPOB, we always emphasize the fact that these systems are designed, always intended to be mutually supportive. Mm -hmm. um, what's really great now, another video that we have put on our website just mm -hmm. recently is from Argentina that shows how that really works. Mm -hmm. And it talks about a couple of nat uh, native plant species in Argentina, uh, Mecadonia and Neurobergia. Mm -hmm. So these are wild species in Argentina, and they have custodians in parts of the country that look after uh, this material. Uh, and they realized that they weren't actually accumulating any benefits from this. So they worked with uh, an international breeding company, uh, mm -hmm. a foreign company, to develop varieties of Macedonia and Nirenberg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They gave them access on the condition that they would share the benefits. And the way they did that was protecting these new varieties uh, so that the share of the royalty, 50% of royalty, goes back to the custodians. Mm -hmm of the uh, the wild material and that's mm -hmm. great because the breeders benefit of course but the custodians of the natural resources yeah. benefit and this is a uh, with the, the video is very interesting because it talks about it from the aspect of the seed institute in assay mm -hmm. also from the technology transfer point of view okay. from uh, India and also the ministry of the environment talking about how this has reduced the pressure on the natural resources as well it's amazing a very good uh, example of where where the two can uh, peacefully coexist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that, that's great. Uh, in the beginning, we talked about the impact of UPOF mm -hmm. in general. Can you maybe highlight a little bit more specifically on the 1991 Act? Okay, yes, and that's another area where now we're we're beginning to see some uh, clear information on the benefits mm -hmm. of the 1991 mm -hmm. Act. Uh, in fact, I was in Australia uh, earlier on uh, this year, and there it was quite interesting because uh, Australia joined UPOV under the 1978 Act, uh, and they had a successful system, but what we saw in Australia was that uh, for crops like wheat, uh, where there's farm safe seed, there was no real incentive for the private sector to engage in plant breeding. So the, the breeding was done in wheat by the public sector. Uh, until uh, they joined the 1991 Act, that was the case. Uh, so there was around 17 million uh, Australian dollars annually invested mm -hmm. in wheat breeding. Around 10 years after they changed the system to become UPOF 1991 Act member, they saw mm -hmm. the investment in wheat breeding doubled to uh, 35 yeah. million Australian uh, dollars. Uh -huh. Not only that, whereas before 95% was in the public sector and so it was all public funded, uh, after that, then it was all in the private sector. So the government mm -hmm. wasn't having to subsidize plant breeding, and yet there was twice as, as much investment taking place. Um, and we're also seeing a, a big impact in, in Canada. Canada more recently joined UPOV back in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, they were previously members under the 1978 Act. Yeah. And it was very interesting to see the instant impact as soon as they uh, implemented the 1991 Act. There was investment by breeding companies in cereals, uh, in, in Canada that hadn't happened in the same way before. There mm. are pr partnerships between uh, foreign companies, domestic Canadian uh, companies mm -hmm. to start wheat breeding programs. Uh, new kinds of breeding programs, public-private producer okay. partnerships for Canadian prairie spring wheat. And also we had a high-level study tour there uh, earlier this year. And what we saw is individuals now incentivized okay. to actually go into plant breeding. We mm -hmm. met one uh, one farmer, one breeder, that started up on oat breeding, thanks to the 1991 mm -hmm. Act of the Convention. And all of this is very strongly supported by the, the farmers. We met the farmers' organizations, mm -hmm. and, and they were all very supportive of this move to the 1991 Act, because they realized 
this will mean more investment in breeding, better varieties to that, yeah. and that's what they want. Yeah. Great. Peter, you already mentioned uh, in the beginning the online application tool, uh, Prisma, it's mm -hmm. called. Can you, can you share the latest update on where you are? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a great tool. And originally, we had a fairly simplistic idea, I guess, on that our aim was really to introduce a tool that would help breeders to, mm -hmm. to make applications around the world. And, and sure enough, that's the case. But what we maybe hadn't realized is how important we think this is going to be in terms of opening up new opportunities. And that's going to mean, I think, uh, farmers, growers around the world are going to have access to more varieties that they, than they would otherwise done because... Uh, we realize it's quite tricky to make uh, applications for plant breeders' rights in different offices around the world. You have to find the application forms. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the languages. And New Pop Prisma um, uh, solves that in a very easy way. And we knew that breeders would find it interesting, but we, we're now really seeing that it's uh, particularly new uh, breeders, small mm -hmm. uh, enterprises, individuals, they're really finding it a huge benefit. And as soon mm -hmm. as they find out about it, they're really enthusiastic. Okay. And, uh, but our challenge, as I think we talked about before, is really to make sure breeders know about this. Mm -hmm. So not breeders in general, but particularly the people that are responsible for making mm -hmm. the applications because unless they know about this tool, then uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. interest, uh, it's interesting for those that know, but those that don't know about it mm -hmm. uh, don't get the opportunity to take advantage. So this is a great opportunity uh, to spread the world. Go have a look at the UPOP website, uh, go and have a look at uh, the information about UPOP Prisma and also all these videos about the impact of the UPOP system mm -hmm. around the world. I did take a look at the website and I saw that for this year, Prisma is for free. Absolutely. Yep. It's going to be for free. We really want to make sure that people have an opportunity to learn mm -hmm. how it works, what it does for free without having to worry about does this make mm -hmm. economic sense for us. So that's really the, the main drive behind it. And we've just expanded the coverage considerably. We're now up to 30 UPOD members covering 69 countries worldwide, many of them covering all crops and species. So really worth having a try and it costs you nothing as you say very good news thank you peter okay thanks myself pleasure